This episode and others like it are brought to you by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. Get some cool perks and help support the show by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash second thought. I also recently launched a new channel dedicated to the nuts and bolts of making a living as a creative. If that sounds like something you'd enjoy, you can check it out at the link below. And I've been asked directly, would you do it again? I, if you give me the same circumstances, I would not hesitate. According to Doctors Without Borders, its hospital in northern Afghanistan came under repeated direct attack on Saturday from a U.S. AC-130 gunship. When a mistake occurs, uh, the United States owns up to it, uh, and we vow to get to the bottom of what exactly happened. Tried to meddle in other countries' elections? Oh, probably. That's why tomorrow I'm going to send to Congress, help us build a world that is safer, more peaceful, more prosperous for our children and grandchildren. Are we the baddies? Honestly, I, I, could, I could just leave it at that. Not great. Okay, friends, today we're going to tackle a big topic, and one that might make my fellow Americans a little uncomfortable if you haven't grappled with this stuff before. Before we begin, I'd like to offer a quick disclaimer, because I know I'm going to get a ton of misguided comments. I am not anti-American in the sense that most self-professed patriots would use the term. I love the land, I love my neighbors, and as a Texan, you better believe I love Whataburger. I am anti-American in the sense that I do not support the United States as a political project. A nation founded on genocide, theft, and slavery has no right to exist, and certainly has no right to act as an occupying force all over the world, dictate trade agreements, fund proxy wars and death squads, foment coups, and generally act as a barrier to self-determination and genuine freedom. When people say things like, you're not patriotic, I find it a little disingenuous, because what could be more patriotic than recognizing your country's flaws and working to build a better society? Anyway, this is a massive topic. There's no way I can even mention all the crimes the US has committed. So I'm gonna leave a bunch of resources in the description if you'd like to learn more. Originally, I was gonna keep this nice and organized and have a few categories with one major example each, but there were just too many to pick from. So let's just dive in and take a brief stroll through the history of the US empire. We'll start at the beginning with the genocide of the Native Americans. When Europeans first laid eyes on what they called the New World, it's estimated there were around 15 million indigenous people living in North America. By the end of the 19th century, there were just 200,000. 14.8 million people were killed by these foreign invaders who, without any sense of self-awareness, considered the native population savages. Perhaps the most infamous period of the genocide is known today as the Trail of Tears, which lasted from 1830 to 1840. This project, initiated by President Andrew Jackson, a war criminal and slavery enthusiast, and approved by the United States Congress, had the explicit goal of removing Native Americans from the land the U.S. was currently colonizing, and relocating them across the Mississippi. The problem was, most of these people didn't want to leave their homes. So, naturally, the U.S. butchered as many as it took until the Native population complied. The actual relocation process was incredibly dangerous, and thousands of people died of disease, starvation, or exposure to the elements. Of course, that was of no consequence to the US government. They had achieved their goal. Vast new swaths of land to colonize and turn into farmland to be worked by an army of slaves. This is just one short 10-year period in the history of the genocide of Native Americans, but it's indicative of the cruelty and calculated inhumanity that underpins the American project. Find land or resources you want, kill the locals, and maximize profits by making use of slave labor. I've left a number of books on this genocide in the description, and I highly recommend my American viewers take a look. What we're taught in school does not reflect the magnitude of the crimes our country committed. Early Americans participated in the eradication of the bison specifically to starve the indigenous peoples. They attacked villages and butchered men, women, and children to universal praise. They did everything they could to make the native people who were just trying to exist seem like evil monsters bent on destroying the American project. There's a reason Hitler had such admiration for this period in American history, but we'll get to that later. For now, let's move on to some good old-fashioned war crimes. The United States is an exceptionally warlike nation. 
In the 247 years since its inception, the US has been at war for all but 17 of them. The country sees itself as the world police, the shining city on a hill that has the moral responsibility to enforce our conception of society on everyone else. This country talks a big game about the importance of freedom and the right to self-determination. But the United States has never once embodied those values. One early example is the Philippine-American War. At the end of the Spanish-American War, the United States annexed the Philippines. The island nation didn't want that, and declared independence. The United States, a country halfway around the world, said too bad. By the US State Department's own admission, the resulting war killed some 20,000 Filipino combatants and over 200,000 civilians, with some estimates going as high as 1 million people. The US military was brutal, engaging in scorched earth tactics and forcing tens of thousands into concentration camps where thousands of civilians died in unspeakable conditions. Once again, all this because the US saw something it wanted and chose not to recognize the rights and desires of the people who lived there. Let's fast forward a little bit. Less than 50 years after the massacre in the Philippines, another island nation was ready to surrender to the Allied powers. At the very end of World War II, Japan was thoroughly beaten. But even though the Allies were just beginning to celebrate victory, the United States had already set its sights on a new geopolitical and economic rival. The Soviet Union had grown from a pre-industrial backwater to the second most powerful nation on Earth in less than 50 years, and the US didn't want them to get any ideas. So on the 6th and 9th of August 1945, the United States dropped nuclear bombs on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, vaporizing over 200,000 civilians. There are those who attempt to justify the bombing, saying that it saved countless lives by ending the war. But this is misguided at best and an outright lie at worst. Japan was ready to surrender. This is an established fact. But perhaps more damning than that is the fact that Hiroshima and Nagasaki were chosen not because they were military targets, but because they were population centers. And what better way to scare a geopolitical rival than to say, we're willing to kill this many civilians in an instant to get what we want. The United States remains the only nation on Earth to have used nuclear weapons against other human beings. And we did it twice, on civilians, on purpose. Continuing along the bloody path of US history, we get to the Cold War, a period of about 50 years where the US, desperate to maintain its newfound post-war dominance, really ramped up their imperialist tendencies. According to a report by the New York Times, the United States launched at least 81 overt or covert interventions between 1946 and 2000. Latin America was of particular interest and saw regime change projects in Nicaragua, Honduras, Panama, Mexico, and the Dominican Republic. Then you had the 1953 CIA-backed coup in Iran, which deposed the left-leaning, democratically elected President Mossadegh and reinstalled the despotic Shah of Iran. As we'll see shortly, the CIA becomes especially vital to US meddling in this period. Another one of their pet projects was trying to assassinate Fidel Castro, the revolutionary leader of Cuba. They made at least 668 attempts to eliminate the beloved leader, trying everything from poison to gunmen to Looney Tunes-style exploding cigars. Despite the CIA's best efforts, Castro lived a long, healthy life, finally passing away in 2016. For anyone unfamiliar with the story of the Cuban Revolution and their efforts at resisting US imperialism, I highly recommend you check out Season 2 of Blowback. It's a fantastic podcast. Perhaps the most infamous US intervention of the era was the 1973 coup in Chile. In early September 1970, the people of Chile elected the Democratic Socialist Salvador Allende as president. Allende was by all accounts a good man. He recognized what life was like for the masses, and enacted sweeping reforms to raise the standard of living for average Chileans. This included nationalizing some of their industry, particularly in mining. The United States, and the late Henry Kissinger, didn't like that. A few months before the election, he had said, quote, I don't see why we need to stand idly by and watch a country go communist due to the irresponsibility of its own people. This was the Empire's philosophy in a nutshell. The United States has the right to interfere wherever it wants to secure its interests. And that's just what they did in Chile. 
Not even a week after Allende was elected, Kissinger had concocted a plan with the CIA to destabilize and overthrow the Chilean government. On September 11, 1973, the presidential palace was bombed, seized, and after delivering a brief speech full of hope for the future of Chile, Allende took his own life rather than be captured. Here's what he said. Workers of my country, I have faith in Chile and its destiny. Other men will overcome this dark and bitter moment when treason seeks to prevail. Go forward knowing that sooner rather than later, the great avenues will open again and free men will walk through them to construct a better society. Long live Chile, long live the people, long live the workers. The fascist general Augusto Pinochet, backed by the US government, assumed control of the country, imprisoning, torturing, disappearing, and murdering tens of thousands of Chileans. This reign of terror would go on for 17 years. But the outright violence was only part of the master plan. Shortly after the coup, Pinochet invited none other than Milton Friedman, along with a bunch of Chicago school lackeys, to devise a new economic agenda for the country. And so Chile became the guinea pig for laissez-faire, libertarian free market policy, leading inevitably to economic collapse in 1982. But sometimes, rigging elections and deposing democratically elected leaders just isn't enough. Sometimes, the US decides to secure its interest by fighting, funding, or otherwise enabling devastating proxy wars. As with the aforementioned interventions, the Cold War was the primary factor driving US involvement in places like Vietnam and Korea. We were desperate not to let communism be seen as a viable economic alternative to capitalism, and it was starting to catch on. So the US did what it does best, butcher civilians in the name of maintaining its dominance. U.S. activity in Vietnam cost some 365,000 civilian lives. Massacres, the burning of entire villages, indiscriminate bombing, the use of napalm, white phosphorus, and millions of gallons of chemical weapons that to this day cause birth defects in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. In Korea, what's often referred to as the Forgotten War here in the United States, the U.S. killed between 2 and 3 million civilians. The North lost a full 20% of its population. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that Korea is the Forgotten War. It's not that we've forgotten, it's that our government doesn't like to remind us that they slaughtered millions of people just so capitalism wouldn't have to contend with an economic challenger. If you'd like to learn more about the Korean War, check out Blowback Season 4. And these are just two of the more well-known proxy conflicts during the Cold War. But there were many, many more, and they remain a favorite tool of the US Empire to this day. But we can't talk about war crimes and civilian casualties without talking about the Iraq War. Today, 20 years after the start of the so-called War on Terror, it's no longer controversial to say that the Iraq War was started based on a lie. This is a well-established fact. Anyone who tries to say otherwise is either in complete denial or is acting in bad faith. For the younger viewers in the audience, the United States made a big show of saying they had proof Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction. They did not. And so based on false testimonies that served the interests of empire, the United States invaded Iraq and occupied it for years. What was once a vibrant, thriving nation was obliterated in what were called shock and awe campaigns. The US military targeted communications, electricity, vital infrastructure such as roads, bridges, and water treatment facilities. Anything they could do to inflict maximum suffering. Over the course of the war, the US killed at least one million Iraqis. But beyond the evil of starting the war under false pretenses was the even more unspeakable evil of Abu Ghraib. This secret prison was operated by US personnel who engaged in torture, sexual assault, and other war crimes. I can't even show the unblurred images here, but I'm sure you recognize some of them just from the silhouette. That's how infamous this prison was. As with everything else in this video, there are links in the description to learn more. And of course, Blowback has a season on the Iraq War as well. Heck, at this point I've mentioned almost every season, just go listen to all of them, they're great. Before this video gets too long, it's important we also address one of the crimes the US is currently committing. Over the last few months, the Israeli occupation has drastically ramped up its genocide of the Palestinian people, using a surprise attack by the Palestinian resistance as justification. To be clear, this violence did not start on October 7th. 
the Palestinian people have been subjected to brutal colonial cruelty for the past 75 years. It's not a complex issue. If you don't feel confident enough to take a position yet, that's perfectly fine. I would just ask that you educate yourself on the subject, because this is one of those issues where people decades from now will look back and say, how did decent people watch this happen and do nothing? I'd recommend you start with Ilan Pape's book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. He's an Israeli historian, so there can't be any accusations of pro-Palestinian bias there. Just be warned, it's a harrowing read. So how does the US fit into this? Well, Israel is a client state of the US. It serves as a vital geopolitical foothold in the region. That's literally the only reason the US cares about Israel, regardless of how elected officials try to sell it. Don't believe me? Here's current President Joe Biden back in 1986. There's no apology to be made. None. It is the best $3 billion investment we make. Were there not an Israel, the United States of America would have to invent an Israel to protect her interest in the region. The United States would have to go out and invent an Israel. The US provides Israel with funding, weapons, ammunition, equipment for their missile defense system, and most importantly, unconditional support for their genocidal project. Elected officials are very nearly unanimous in their defense of the apartheid regime, including one-time progressive champion Bernie Sanders. US media uncritically repeats Israeli propaganda 24-7, despite all of it being debunked, including by intergovernmental bodies like the UN and humanitarian groups like Doctors Without Borders. Just a few weeks ago, the UN voted on a resolution to demand an immediate ceasefire. Of the 193 member states, only 10 voted against the resolution. Among them, the United States. Many people, myself included, believe that this unconscionable backing of the most explicit genocide in modern history will be the nail in the coffin of US legitimacy abroad. No country on Earth beyond our Western European vassals will ever again believe a word the US says about freedom, democracy, human rights, or self-determination. The only difference between the United States and Israel is that the genocide of Native Americans was almost absolute, and Israel hasn't achieved that goal yet. There's a reason Hitler spoke so highly of US colonization efforts. It was complete extermination. And I guarantee you the same arguments we're hearing today from defenders of the Israeli genocide of Palestinians were used to justify the atrocities committed in North America. Just about everyone agrees that what the European colonizers did to the Native Americans was wrong. And now a couple hundred years later we're doing land acknowledgements and pretending it was always unanimous that the genocide was bad. The same thing is happening with the genocide in Palestine. As with everything else, I've left a bunch of resources on this issue in the description. Well, that was grim. It's always hard making these videos because there's so much to say and I have statistics on how long the average viewer sticks around. I didn't even mention the CIA's domestic operations or Operation Paperclip or the embargo on Cuba or the UN resolutions that show the US being the sole vote against classifying food as a human right or any number of other things. The bottom line is this. There is a reality that we are not exposed to here in the United States. There's a reason the majority of the world hates us. Not us specifically, but the nation, the flag on the invader's uniform. The United States is the single greatest barrier to progress in the world, bar none. This country is responsible for some of the most reprehensible crimes against humanity the world has ever seen. If you're thinking, but it says right here in my history book that the good guys want every war. Maybe it's time to think about who writes the history books and what interests benefit from the American people remaining uneducated and blindly patriotic. You and I may be good people, but as the United States of America, yeah, we're the bad guys. Hey there. I mentioned at the beginning of the episode that I recently launched a new channel. It's hard to believe, but for the past 10 years now, I've made my living as a creative professional. Over that time, I've picked up a lot of useful tips and tricks, and now I'd like to share them with the next generation of creators. This new channel is dedicated not only to teaching others how to make a career out of working creatively, but also to sharing some general musings on living a creative life. I'm really excited for this project, and I hope I can make a difference to anyone out there who wants to do what I do but doesn't know where to start. So if you're interested in YouTube, or podcasting, or documentary work, or just want a little peek behind the scenes, consider subscribing. I've got one video out already, and the second episode is coming next Friday.
I'm going to stagger the releases of Second Thought and this new channel so you've always got something to watch Friday mornings at 9 a.m. Central Time. As always, thanks for watching, drop a thumbs up if you liked the episode, a thumbs down if you hated it, and I'll see you in the next one.